So welcome everyone. Tony, did you get your audio fixed up there? I don't think so. So we'll just give you a thumbs up. Welcome to the group, Tony. <laughs> uh, maybe everything you want to say, save for the next uh, for the next Zoom call in July. But Tony's a new member that's joining us tonight. So welcome to Tony. Okay, I'm going to try to uh, share screen here. You see how that goes. Okay, everybody should see that then. Okay, can everybody see that? Just give me a thumbs up. All right, great. Okay, so this is our uh, June 15th session and John Paul Andres here from, uh, from Nova Scotia and I'm here from Kingston, Ontario. Um, what we're gonna do is we'll open it up and just a quick welcome and open for questions, any comments or questions you have from any of our previous uh, Zoom calls. Um, we'll talk a little bit of projects on the workbench. A number of you sent me in some really interesting projects, and um, and Murray sent in actually a, a, a idea of a project that he'd like us to talk about, and so we'll, we'll deal with that as well. Uh, Fred is going to take us through a really nice little project that he completed recently on Snoopy and Woodstock, and um, we'll leave that for Fred to go through, but... Um, and he'll mention it again, but I'll mention to you now that, you know, Fred's willing to send you the full documentation on how to pull that together um, should you be interested in trying this project. So Fred's going to go through that for us. Um, we've had a number of wood carving shows. Uh, we had a show in Belleville, Ontario, Niagara Falls, and in Kitchener. And so uh, Murray sent me a few photos, and, uh, and I had a couple of photos as well. So we'll take a look at um, the photos that we do have. Uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about the Lang event. So recall, we're going to, going to try to get together a few of us in uh, in Lang near Peterborough, the Lang Pioneer Village, and we'll just talk very briefly about that. A couple of people have asked me how to carve a bow. They've seen the little bows that I've carved for um, uh, the little Christmas bell ornaments that I've put together. So I put a few slides together and I'll just show you how to carve, um, how I go about carving a bow. Um, Time permitting, John would like uh, to start a little discussion about our the potential, at least, for our next uh, virtual competition and show. And so uh, this is just some preliminary thinking. Get your ideas and uh, start thinking about putting something together uh, sometime in 2023. Okay. So let's just kind of open it up. Unmute yourselves if you have uh, a question or a comment you'd like to make. Um, John, you were talking to me earlier, and you had a few questions about your little uh, your little carving holder. Maybe you'd like to just pick up on that right now. You'll have to unmute yourself, though. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, I had a, a question about the carving handle. Can you see it, Mark? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I do. Okay, I can't see it on my uh, camera okay. here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, this handle that I use to put, to put on uh, uh, the heads or you know do my carving with it, I use this handle just for a safety uh, item. Uh, you can make it out of a dowel, or whatever whatever you need. Like this is a number six. It's for the smaller pieces. And this uh, I, I turned this on the lathe. It's a little fancier than. It has to be, but I have one. One of those here. It's just a, a one inch dowel. And I just, uh, what I do is I, I cut a screw head off, put the screw in, and uh, put glue in there. Uh, two part epoxy, and that's it. And that's uh, what I use to carve the heads. It's uh, instead of holding onto the head, I'm holding onto the handle and carving the head. Just a little protection. That's, that's uh, that was the question. Okay. Any that's other? It, Mark. Uh, thanks. Any other uh, questions or comments from anyone? Okay. Let's look at um, some of the projects on the workbench then. <laughs> So, Bob, you sent in a few slides here, and I'll, I'll let you talk through these. 
Yes, these were just a couple of uh, projects that we had uh, at uh, our clutches and uh, just a challenge for everybody to uh, do little uh, small ornaments. It's, did you did you develop the pattern or did it did everybody use the same pattern, Bob? Uh, everybody used the same pattern. No, I didn't develop it. Uh, John Bowser, he he was the one that uh, came up with the pattern. That's nice. <clears throat> and this was a little bear we did uh, at our East Crunch. It was done by uh, Bob Grimsby. He he um, he just moved in <laughs> our area. And he's quite talented carver and uh, just a little project he came up with. Very nice. Bob Gander. <clears throat> Bob, that's Bob Gander. And Gander, right, sorry. Gander. Yeah, this little Viking I uh, I came up with, uh, I just took it off a project and uh, the sword and the shield are all separate and I just... Uh, inserted them into his hand. Really good. Bob, I like how round this is at the front here. Much to your advice. No, no, that's that's really well done. Like that's that's exactly what you want to see is that round belt, you know, and we, we've said several times and I've fallen into the same habit and I see the same habit on a lot of the Facebook uh, posts that people get into um, doing the detail of carving a belt on a fairly flat surface. And then they realize, geez, that should have been rounder and they have to carve off all of the detail that they put in. But you did a nice job of, you know, taking care of that nice roundness and then putting the belt in. That looks good. Thank you. And this is just a little uh, card holder I came up with. For uh, business cards or uh, something like that. <laughs> That's good. That's, That's good. Okay, any uh, questions or comments for Bob? I like, I like that the last one with the business card. It's, it, you, it sees like looks like it's uh, he's got something heavy in his hand, or yeah. it's really uh, well done. It's going to be be a good carving. Nice. Instead of a straight up and down, got to get a little lean to it. That's good. Yeah, the way it's good. leading off to the side here, right? Eh? Yeah, it looks like it's heavy or something. Yeah. Eh? It's holding it. Yeah. I think the card that uh, is being held by the little guy there, that's uh, a gift card that Bob won because he won the, our Wood Wizard for the Year competition. Mm -hmm. He contributed a lot of carvings and uh, he had the to the largest total number of points for uh, all the wood wizard uh, carvings that he had done. So that Lee right. Valley card is actually a gift card that he got at the, at the end of the year, just uh, uh, a week or two ago. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So say something, say a little bit more about this wood wizard. You say you get points. What do you get points for? Yeah, yeah. if, if you're, anybody can uh, uh, carve the particular carving that's asked for. It could be a Christmas ornament. Uh, uh, we had a, a tulip, a fancy tulip, or a, a, an egg cup holder, things like that. So everybody tries to do the same thing, their, their own design, but on that topic. And then we have one of the people judge the, the entries. And the, the uh, top entry uh, for a particular week, it's uh, 15 points, second, I think 13, third, 11, and nine for honorable mention. And any additional, uh, you know, a person could enter a couple items for that particular month, and he gets eight points uh, for the other item that, or any of the items that didn't get a, an award. So we to total up all of the, the the points for each person throughout the year, and then whoever has the largest number of points, they they get the the, the top one, and then first, second, or third honorable mention. What a great idea. Yeah. And that's been going for, for many years now, apparently, at the Udaway Wood Carvers. Hmm. I wonder if we should steal that somehow, John. Yeah, sounds good. Do something, you know, and uh, the winner gets a home-cooked lobster dinner. You and Wayne can put it together. 
Yeah. <laughs> Wayne don't cook, <laughs> <laughs> but you like know a lot of you know a lot of lobster men though. Yeah, and I know a good cook too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bob. Any other questions or comments for Bob? Those really nice carvings, Bob. Thanks for sending those to me. So this is the little bell that I did since our last get together. Now you you recall Mark Stobert did such a terrific job in describing how he goes about doing his carvings. I just really enjoyed Mark's uh, presentation and I learned a lot from him. So one of the things that I did is um, instead of doing my regular face carving on this particular little Christmas bell, and of course it, it has to be painted, uh, I, I, I thought of Mark's style with the kind of the pudgier face and the double chin and tried to mimic that a little bit. I didn't do as good a job, of course, as Mark has done on his beautiful carvings, but uh, that was a, a fun little twist to... Uh, my little Christmas bell. And this is the bell that, or the, the bow rather that I'm talking about that later in the, in the Zoom call today, I'll just talk about how I go about doing those. Okay. Roger. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I've showed this uh, at stages, I think last year and I finished it, finished it just before Christmas. Uh, and it was for a doctor who also raises bees for making honey. So uh, this is the final product. I showed you the unfinished bits and pieces. Uh, I'm 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 actually reluctant to show the next slide, Roger, because <laughs> the the wound is so ter terrible that uh, anybody <laughs> that's a little bit queasy might. <laughs> <laughs> It was fun doing, and it was the enjoyment I got of was I made tried to make a caricature out of everything, even the table and the uh, the beehives that are the stand for it. So uh, it was fun, and I think yeah, he enjoyed like, it. Looks like it. Looks like a lot of fun. Any comments or questions for Roger? I'm nervous. That's really good, Roger. Huh? How'd you do that bow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm the one that asked Mark to show us how to do a bull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these were these are just two bottle stoppers I've been working on for. Uh, we're heading down to the Maritimes for our summer vacation, and on the way we're stopping off with a friend in Quebec City, and so I wanted to give him a thank you gift, and uh, so the one on the right is is. Uh, his regiment. So I did a little bottle stopper with that, with his cap badge. And the one on the left is the guy was in the Navy. So I tried to mark that up. I had a lot of fun with the cap, the sea captain, trying to get a modeled face. You know, I wanted this guy to look like he'd been really weathered. And so if you look closely, it looks like he's got a very modeled face. The difficulty with this one was painting in yellow. Hmm. I didn't re realize how difficult yellow was going to be and uh, I was using a paint from a local company called Art Noise and uh, I ended up at the very end after a couple of uh, washes saying the hell with it and I literally put the coat on directly uh, out of the bottle because I wanted to get that sort of plasticy rubbery texture mm -hmm. and I wasn't getting that out of uh, washes mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. those are my uh, efforts for this uh, spring anyway Really good. So where are you heading down in Mar Maritime? Where are you heading? Uh, we're heading down. Well, we're stopping off in Quebec City and then down through the uh, west coast or, of uh, New Brunswick, up around the Cabot Trail, and then for a week in Halifax with friends. Oh, nice. nice. Have a great time. He, these are really nice carvings, Roger. I, one of the things that I pick up on in these carvings is you've got the eyes nice and deep. You probably could go a little even deeper on these guys' eyes, but yeah. you've got them nice and deep so that the nose protrudes. So, you know, we've we've talked about that, and John's talked about that in, in um, detailing in the face. The only way to get the nose and the cheeks to come out is to get the eyes further back, and you've uh, you've done a good job of that. Okay, Murray. Well, this is my first uh, baseball player, the pitcher, and <clears throat> excuse me, there were some issues with this one, 
and I talked about that before. That was the weakness that there is with the joints being so small. And I drilled through the knee, both up towards the thigh and down towards the foot to put uh, bamboo toothpicks in. It made it a little bit stronger. So the book that I've got has got Chris Hammock uh, showing different ways that he's carved these uh, pitchers in baseball in different poses that there is the wind up and the stare and all that kind of thing that the pitcher goes through. But I chose to make it a little bit different. So it's mine, not just his way of looking at things. And so the next picture sells a bit more of the contrast. This is the recent one I finished this week. <clears throat> and the beard, if you go back to the first, first picture there, the beard is done with the uh, Dremel with a very small round bit to make it look really hairy. So the small uh, touching the beard, uh, touching the wood, makes the hair stand up on it. So I didn't sand that off. I just uh, put my stain on it, my color onto it. And then the next picture, I did the beard differently. That's the uh, small tip of a wood burning uh, tool. And they're together. So it's more like a, you know, five days stubble kind of thing or <laughs> five o'clock shadow maybe. I wanted to do something special here. The stare that he's going through right now is looking at the, uh, the back catcher to try to get the signal. To confuse people just a bit, when you get closer, you chose a little bit on the left-hand picture. I wanted to make him cross-eyed. <laughs> so I dug in the eyes a little bit deeper at that part at the center. And then when I finally put the, the round uh, tool that I have to make the uh, brown part, I went closer to the inside on one side than the other. So when you hold it, it it's really kind of unnerving. He's got this terrible, terrible look at you. <laughs> You know, the head is not fastened on. It's uh, It can be turned. And when I had it straight, it doesn't have near the effect as the head turns sideways. Yeah. Now, the big thing was, if you go back to the very, no, I can't do a short on that one. I, it's one of the other would change this, but Mark has suggested. Oh, the, which, where do you want me to go here, Murray? Yes, yeah, the other one, the baseball glove. Oh, the next the slide? Glove originally, Chris Hammock's carving. He had the arm pulled right back and on the knee. So he braced himself. But I found as I made the bigger glove with the finger sticking out, it looked far better when it was hanging down. And then I was watching a baseball game not too long ago, and this one pitcher had this unique thing. Uh, he would bend over like this, this uh, stare at the batter and the back catcher, and his arm hung straight down almost to the ground, and it swings like a pendulum left and right. It's his style. I've never seen another pitcher do it. And then all of a sudden, after he gets a number of swings in, it pulls up and he goes into this wild throw. And so this guy's not too far off of that. That's really good. Did you want to talk about this slide? Yeah, this is the glove, the new glove. If you see on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see a bit of a line just down from the shirt. And just before the glove, there's kind of, yeah, right there. And that particular line is where the cutoff took place, one of them. And they cut they cut the other mitt off, actually, up here closer to the, I don't know, my mouse is showing that or not, right closer to the glove. So in gluing that on, again, this is the, it's the dowel inside and holding that. So it made the, the glove, and the, the problem I had in looking at this is the first uh, baseball mitt that I carved with that one finger sticking up was just way too small. This is the same size as the one on his back holding the ball. Mm. So it's exaggeration <laughs> with caricature for sure. Wow. Yeah, that looks really good. Comments or questions for Marie? Can you hear me this time? Yeah, I can, Tony. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, what scale is this? This looks really small. I carve with a chainsaw, and I'm amazed at what you guys are doing here. <laughs> <laughs> this is like size, isn't it, Marie? <laughs> <laughs> what can you throw strikes? <laughs> it doesn't really show in these pictures here. This uh, the color, How, Marie. I've used, I've used Marie? an antique wax and colored over the parts that I wanted to darken where the grooves and creases were, and then you rub, you put it on, and then you rub it off. I had sent a picture of that, but we'll talk about it next time.
Yeah. So, Murray, how how big would this carving be? What what would the height of about three to four inches? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Holy crap! So, Tony, you're pretty good with a chainsaw. You could make that happen three or four. Inches. Oh yeah? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you're gonna have to get a smaller chainsaw. I think. <laughs> That's, all That's all. If I sneeze, I'd break it. Jeez. <laughs> I'm impressed though. That's that's pretty fancy. Murray, yeah. I really like this. Um, you know, if if I looked at the two of them, I prefer this type of beard, like the way you did the little bit of stubble. I, I think I think that looks really sharp. I mean, he 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 looks like he's got a, a few days growth there. Yes. Yeah, so. When you get up close to it, you see the beard is uh small strokes, not just a pinpoint, but it's a small stroke so you can have the hair uh the way it the way the hair on your face goes with it with a uh, nap to it yeah and it kind of gives you a different direction it makes the beard look the face look fuller too when you do that really good now murray's going to come back in july and he's going to talk in a little bit more detail about uh, the changes he made and how we made it and i think it's an important thing to talk about because we've touched on the topic a few times that if you're not happy with the way your carvings go going <clears throat> It's not taboo to knock a part of the carving off and put glue another piece of wood on and keep going. So uh, Murray's going to talk a little yeah. bit more about that in detail. Wayne, you sent in some terrific pictures of carvings here. Thank you. Oh. No. Yep, yeah, that's yours, Wayne. Yes. Yep, that's uh, just a sample of some of the ornaments that I do and they uh, sell them down at the local crafts, craft shop, gift shop. Uh, this all came about from COVID. I, I used to go to craft shows and now I can't care enough to go there. Wayne, what is the price that you sell for? <laughs> do you work for Revenue Canada before I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, seriously. I, uh, I, an ornament like that, I get fifteen dollars. Uh, I figures out about two fifty an hour, I suppose. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it, you know, my, my uh, feedback would be you're, you're not charging enough. Um, yeah, that's what I told them. Oh yeah, yeah every, exactly. everybody, everybody tells me that. Yes, and yeah. uh, but, actually, double that amount would be uh, on the light side. These are, re uh, these are really well done carvings. Yes, I um, know. Uh, I've I've been told that, but right yeah. from right from day one, yeah. Uh, uh, pricing has been my my downfall. I, I maybe it's secretly I'm scared that if I up the price, I won't sell as many. Then I'll feel that yeah. hey, maybe my stuff's no good. People aren't aren't buying it a lot. But uh, it's I, I, I'm not really in it to make money. Uh, no, if I no, no, I, I, I recognize that, but um, and, but but these things are are a higher value than fifteen dollars. Yeah. These are really well done. Peggy yeah. just loves these ones. Here. The ones you did with the boy, right. my oh my, what a what a neat idea you did there. So so I, I suspect you've taken a a square piece, you've cut it diagonally to get a flat back, and then carved the face onto the corner. Is that how you did that? No, those are inch and a quarter square. Okay, and and. Uh, I could carve another face on the on the back if I wanted oh, I to. Okay, but uh, 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 Wayne, uh, yes, I think you should up it to twenty dollars. Then you don't need change. No change. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Just the other comment I'd like to make too, Wayne, is that, and for others too, I heard this often at our shows, and the people say, "Oh, I'm not in it for the dollar. I'm not in it to sell." Hmm. But I'd like you to think about something when you say that that there are younger men. The, perhaps are in the 30s and 40s, that kind of thing. They've got a family. Extra income would be a tremendous help to them. And they do have to sell at a little higher price. So undervaluing your things then kind of puts a fact on when they carve something similar, they have to charge about the same amount, not much more. Oh, you drag the whole market down. But I think that yeah. one of the yeah. most important things is to look at what the whole audience is, not just the, the customer buying, but the wood carvers that are coming into this and we all want to have younger guys come and join us there is a, a real possibility that some have started immediately selling that's one of the motivations they have to get their uh, wood carving out there 
So it's just to just to remember, I know some of you have got tremendously high income coming from pensions. I won't put <laughs> pensions on those. Well, but... yeah, that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> when, you look, when you look at the younger fellows coming in, sometimes it's just hard to pay the rent. And the way things are today, this is a great way to do it. Well, I, 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 maybe I should explain a little better too. I, I get fifteen dollars from them, and that's what I was selling them at at the craft shows before COVID. When I went to the uh, to the gift shop and and we talked a deal, I, I told them that's what I wanted. They sell them for twenty four ninety five. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, and and it's good because it it gives them uh, a fundraiser too. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, good. But. Yeah, I, I, like I say, I, I, uh, <laughs> I've been told that right from day one. The, the very first craft show I went to was back, I think, in two thousand and eight, and the quality was nowhere near what they are now. And I didn't know, I, you know, I was nervous, didn't know, even know if I was going to sell one. So I, I had put three dollars on my ornaments. Now, mind you, that like I say, they were nowhere near the quality that they are now. So I had three dollars on, them, and a couple of the crafters. In the, in the show before the doors were open to the public said, oh, you're, you're, you've got to charge more than that. And I said, geez, I don't know. I, I, I doubt if I'll be able to get that for them. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So I did. I actually put them up to $5 the first, the first time before the doors opened. So that was good for a few years. Uh, then wood, the price of wood has gone up, as, as you all know. And uh, so I said, well, okay, I'm still doing craft shows. So I put them up to $8. Well, that was good. I was I was happy with that, excepting that when I went to go to a show, I had to have a, both pockets full of loonies and toonies and everything okay. else to make a change. So that so then I put up the ten dollars, and then finally they went up to fifteen. But that's <laughs> that's been a problem right from day one for sure. And well, and, is, and, and to get back to Mur to get back to Murray about uh, dragging the price down or discouraging other carvers. Uh, Maybe so up in up in the urban areas where you guys live, but I think the, the nearest uh, carver that I know of that I would even be considered to be competing with probably lives fifty miles away. So uh, you know I haven't got much competition either. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are great carvings. The last thing I'll point out here um, that I see in Wayne's carving that's something that that I don't know if we've talked a lot about, but something we can learn from here how simple uh, Wayne has done the lips. And it reminds me, um, I asked the same question of Mark Stobert last uh, Zoom call, how he does the, the mouth and the lips. And you can see Wayne simply came straight down with the upper lip. There's a line there probably cut in and maybe wood burned in and then a lower lip. So there's really not an upper lip in here. It's just straight down a line and a lower lip and it really looks smart. So uh, these are really nice carvings. Wayne, talk about this one. <laughs> This this is a, a work in progress, I guess, or a work that stalled. Uh, about a month, month and a half ago, I started him. I wanted to have a little bit of motion in my in this in this guy. Uh, usually, the guy's just standing there looking bewildered. But so I said, I'll put a little uh, motion in him, get his legs going, and that's the intent. I'll probably paint him up in camo white with a camel jacket or whatever and a red hat but uh i've been stalled i just too many other th too many other things on the go so uh, <laughs> this one uh about nine inches tall but he's about the same height as all the rest of the the south shore rednecks that i've done but, uh, anyway really nice comments or questions for wayne because i think this is great rather than just standing there holding his gun there's a story being told as you look at the carving He's going somewhere, he's seen something, or he's finished, or whatever it is. But that alone puts the carving in a higher class, as far as my feeling is. Yeah. I, you know, and I, to I, that I, point, in Wayne's earlier point of putting motion in it, it's not only a step forward with the legs, he's got motion in the arms, too. You know, just how you swing your arms and, and step at the same time. I, I, just, I just glued those arms in place today. Yeah. Uh, nice. When those pictures were taken, they weren't, uh, they weren't screwed. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that obviously that's not the uh, finished base that's going with it either. That was just so I could have it to uh, visualize it. Probably we'll carve a dog with it. Uh, yeah, the other uh, thing to note is your the back foot is raised up on the heel, really yeah. indicating there's a good step going. He's he's moving. Yeah, he's on his way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nice carving. Thanks. Wade. I see your price of carving. John Poole used to say, everything is for sale, but we're not a dollar store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Just a question. I, I assume that that hat is separate. Glued on? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? This is Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, I'm assuming the hat was carved separately and just glued on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's not glued on yet, but it will be. Ah, yeah. yeah. The, the That's head good. is separate. Right there. Nice you're work. Looking, you're nice looking work. at, you're looking at right in that picture there. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces. The gun, the gun is in two pieces. Okay. Thanks, Wayne. Lee, are you on the line tonight? Yes, yes, I'm here. Great. Oh, yeah. So this one, I combined all of our monthly challenges except for the boot. Uh, and this is actually one of John Paul's uh, rough outs. So it's the, the head, the arms, and the hands are separate. And those are actually the hands from last month's challenge. <laughs> And then uh, you put them all together with this little uh, the, the fence in the back. And uh, I'm still working on a cowboy hat and some other stuff to go in the scene, but I, I haven't gotten that far yet. So. Nice. Very nice. You check oh, out um, one of some of Lynn Doughty's uh, cowboy scenes. He'll, uh, he'll you know, uh, spiral together or braid together some light wire to make it look like a rope yeah. and you'll loop it over one of the one of the, yeah, the posts. posts. Yeah, that looks cool. Yeah. I was thinking of a hat in the and like a lasso on the on the post. And Perfect. I wanted something on the ground down there too. So, yeah. Really nice. He's about twelve inches tall, which is about oh double the size that I normally carve. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a little tricky doing that. Well done. Really well done. Comments or questions for Lee? I like the expression and the way he's looking off to the side, just daring the person to take the first click. And then the yeah. gritting. It's going to be a fight. <laughs> this is a tombstone kind of thing. I don't know which part of the OK Corral he's in. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, uh, John, are you on the call tonight? Maybe not. Uh, John LeMay sent me this one. This is actually, you might recognize it. I recognize it. It's um, it's uh, his uh, version of the little hobo that I did on the uh, on the pump car, the rail car. So he's just starting that out, and uh, he's going to give that a try, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to give him some advice along the way. But he's got a good start there. Nice. <laughs> Tony, you sent me a oh, few. You, you actually sent me a video, Tony, and I couldn't. I did. I couldn't play the video, so I tried to just capture three um, screenshots okay. of it. So why don't you just describe it, and I'll click between the, the shots. Well, this is kind of the opposite of everything you guys are doing. This uh, log weighs about a ton. It's a 14-foot log. Log. Uh, it's a branch that fell off an oak tree, and this customer wanted me to put all their farm animals that they've had on the farm over the years and it's a castle view bed and breakfast and that's the logo that you're looking at there uh castle lodge bed and breakfast sorry so at the one end there was a bunch of branches and i called them the three amigos so, yeah the three dogs so i tried to as much as i could um get the life likeness uh, that they had one is a collie and the middle one is some sort of water dog a labrador or something um, the ones with the I forget what they're all called. And the, and the one on the right is the St. Bernard. So the, the customer just thrilled to pieces. They came over the other day and we had a beer or two and we're looking at them and <laughs> they were giving me ideas of um, what else to do because there, there was a few rotten spots in this log as there always are. And um, so one of the rotten spots um, I started cleaning out and turns out there was a big rotten spot. So it was going to be carved into uh, something else, but now it's going to be a hole and I'm going to put a um, chicken sitting on uh, a nest inside this hole. So I had to make do with what I had. And then on uh, on the other side, there's a um, there's another hole that looks like a mouth. And so they asked me, 
if I could just make it look like a frog's head. So I'm turning it into a frog's head. So anyways, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going on, I'm making progress with this thing. And then one of the last things they asked me to do the other day was, could I put a donkey on there? Hmm. So the donkey they wanted was donkey, you know, donkey from Shrek. Yeah. So I've done, I pretty much have donkey finished at the other end of this log. And this thing is going to look, um, ridiculous when it's all finished it's <laughs> i'm 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 it's um i'm having so much fun doing this it's just one of these crazy things and this is chainsaw work right i have to get heavy duty equipment to move this thing around because like i said it weighs a ton so a backhoe and a flatbed trailer to move that back into a place when the, um, it get goes back to their house but um that's it's really it, that's really oh it's that's it's heavy duty work and i'm i've got to grind and sand the whole surface to make it look reasonable because there's um surface rot all over the place and so i've got to clean that down and um um it's it's turning out pretty good this one in the foreground that's supposed to be a goat so the goat is in way too far way more than i wanted it but it turns out that was a rotten spot so <laughs> i had already started carving the goat so then i tried to make the best of it and so the goat is down in a bit of a hole. So it's a goat's head in there. And um, um, yeah. Oh, oh, and you can see the uh, the big head down at the other end of this picture. I don't know if you're uh, seeing it. Yeah, that right, right there. So that was a big hole from a, a tree and a tree branch. And um, well, anyways, the opening just looked like a mouth. So we made it look like a frog. So with Google eyes and I just kind of outlined a little bit so I had a head on it. And um, with uh, with chainsaw work, I, I tend to do a lot of wood burning on it. So I highlight, you know, the eyes and light and dark with uh, wood burning. I don't do so much. Um, I don't do so much painting on something like that. This will just get stained and varnished when it's done and that'll be it. And just all my accents will be done with a, a little blowtorch. And that, that's really uh, interesting. Now you're going yeah. to hang around us now and uh, you're going to learn uh, all about the 2000 caricature carvings you could have made out of that log. I 2000. Okay. I'm, I'm joined this because I want to learn how to do faces. Good. I want to, that was partly why I joined it. Cause I, I'm no good at doing faces. So it's, um, it's, it's my weakness that I have. Cause I That's did, good. um, I don't know if you guys know, uh, American Gothic, that, uh, yeah. that yeah. painting. Well, I had a, um, a neighbor of mine ask me to do that for him in wood. I don't have the picture. I didn't send that to you. So I did that and it looks it looks pretty close to the picture. But on the other side, since it was blank, I kind of did yeah. a spoof. I did a spoof of the two of them, the husband and the wife, right? I kind of followed the same you. thing. He has a hat and a mustache and uh, threw all kinds of things in there. So cool. that, turned out pretty, cool. that turned out pretty funny. Well, so I'm, glad anyway, I'm glad you're with us now. So we'll be looking forward <laughs> to seeing more of this. Thanks. Any okay. any questions or comments for Tony? This one? You'll, you'll just have to mute, Lee. Okay. Um, Murray, you're on the line tonight, I think. Two and two. No, two and two. Hey, Lee, you'll, Lee, you'll just have to mute, okay? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Murray, are you on the line tonight? I was hoping Murray was on the line. Um, Mike, uh, Mike Southern here. Uh, uh, Murray and I are doing this project together, and he is on the call. I saw his face there, but uh, I, I could speak to it too if he can't get his. Uh, maybe his, he can't get the microphone going or something. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Why don't you go ahead, Mike? Okay. Um, the two of us have been involved with a uh, group for many years, which has created uh, over 30 different uh, nature posts where kids do rubbings of, uh, of a natural object. It could be like a frog or a, uh, a certain kind of tree or something. And uh, they're scattered all over the Thunder Bay area. And this was put up by a group called Big Boreal Adventure. And we've been a, uh, a sponsor for them over the years. Uh, we did a Christmas tree ornament project and raised 16,000 bucks for them uh, selling Christmas ornaments uh, years ago. And uh, they just came out with a new version and added more posts uh, 
uh, for people to visit. It's a family oriented kind of get out in nature thing. Uh, and their, their uh, mascot is this guy, uh, Jack Pine. Um, hmm. And uh, so Murray had the idea <laughs> that we start a new fundraiser with the Thunder Bay Carvers to uh, make these little Jack Pine guys and sell them uh, possibly as Christmas tree ornaments or, uh, or something like that. And um, we've, we're just in the early stages of this project. Uh, we just introduced it to the club at our wind up uh, potluck last night. Um, and we're, we're going to uh, the uh, big Boreal committee uh, as well. But um, we've started doing prototypes of these, uh, these little, little guys. And uh, I've, I've got two, I, I see now, I have to figure out how to show you those. Um, hmm. Do I switch the camera maybe? Is that how you uh, do you, I think you just hold it up in front of your face there, Mike. Yeah, I can't even see myself though. So I, um, I don't know if I'm holding it right or not. Here's one of these little guys. So you see, we tried to use the pattern. You see, that's right off their uh, big Boreal adventure booklet. Uh, can you see that at all? Or Yeah, we can. Okay. There are two versions of this guy. Uh, throughout the booklet, the children use the booklet to keep track of their uh, visits to all these different nature posts. And there's a second guy, uh, this guy here, uh, and he's wearing a toque. I don't know if you can see that. No, I don't see that one. Okay. No. I don't, see, I don't know where I should be putting this because I can't see myself, unfortunately. Put it right Let's... over the cone. Put it right over the cone. Over... The, the cone on your desk there. The... Oh, okay. This one right here. That showing? No. No. Okay. I'm trying to figure out. I, I we're, we're, get... we're looking at a little plastic bag with a pine cone in it, and behind it is a piece of paper with the. Oh, there you go. Okay. The yeah. camera switch. Yeah, there, there you go. Oh, you just had it there. Is it? Okay. Just a sec. Okay. Is that right now? Hold it in front of your left. face. To my left? Yeah. And just a little bit higher. Yeah, perfect. A little bit too high. Okay. Okay. So this is the guy with the uh, with the pine cone. You see, he's got great big eyes, and uh, you can see the bracts for the. It's a jack pine. Of course, he's called Jack Pine, and uh, he's the little mascot. And on every page, there's another version of him, an artistic version of him doing something or other. Notice we didn't put any arms or legs on him because we didn't know how that would work out. These are usually rather young children that would do this with their families. Uh, this one is done in, in basswood. The other one uh, is done in uh, cottonwood bark, a little, a little bigger, and it's, it's a Christmas ornament, so I have it on a hanger here. So I don't know if that's showing, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, Murray, uh, Murray was wondering, I just, <laughs> just saw this at the last minute before the, before, before the uh, meeting tonight. Um, wondering if anyone had any suggestions for our project. Uh, one person last night had a good suggestion for us that this guy with the toque is too small. And I, I, we agree, I think we're gonna make that one bigger. Um, and another one suggestion was to make it into not just a, a Christmas tree ornament for sale, but also possibly a uh, keychain fob. Uh, that's another option. So I don't know. Uh, it was interesting to hear through that discussion earlier on uh, sales of things. And uh, we would actually be carving them and giving them to the Big Boreal Adventure Committee. Um, and, and the sales will be really up to them in the end. But uh, as far as setting price and so on is concerned and venues for sales. But um, any advice about the designs or uh, how to do it or, uh, or the sales or anything would be much appreciated from this group. Okay, let's just open it up. Does anybody have any uh, anything to offer uh, Mike and uh, Murray on how to go about this? Any suggestions? He, he mentioned uh, Christmas tree ornaments or Christmas ornaments. Uh, they, I think they'd adapt well to fridge magnets too. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, fridge like magnets. Uh, yeah, so do a, like a flat version sort of thing. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, carve them on a corner on a, on a three-corner block and, and uh, yeah. get a good... A good uh, magnet, say from Lee Valley or somewhere. Yeah, those they, rare earth magnets will hold quite a bit. Yeah, they'll, they'll tear the door off the fridge if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, any other ideas for this project? As I say, we're trying to. We're just in the early stages of this. Uh, Murray just came up with this idea, and we're trying to run with it. And uh, 
the club looks like they're going to get behind us, behind us on this. And so anyway, it's just kind of a fun and very different kind of caricature, if you could say that. I had never thought of having a pine cone be a caricature. <laughs> but there it is. <laughs> I uh, took a screenshot of it, uh, Mike, and may try to take the challenge on to do one. Sorry, say that again, Murray. I did a screenshot of it, keeping the picture for myself, and oh. I may try to make one from my screenshot I took. Oh, well, thank you, Murray. That'd be great. Yeah, you could see that uh, we sort of worked off the corner of a basswood block about one and three quarter to two inches uh, square, uh, and you know, roughly three inches high, I guess. Sort of, I just passed out the patterns last night to a good number of the club members, uh, and and the thing about jack pine cones is if you look at real ones, they're very different one from the other. Uh, they have all kinds of gnarly little bumps and, and so on and valleys. And, uh, so we'll probably carry that concept forward and say, you know, you can do your own interpretation. It can be a little yes. certainly different than some of the others. The toques could be different colors. The, the little guy I did in the toque here is the same color as in the booklet. But the booklet is sort of monochromatic. There's not many colors in it. Um, so people could play around with those toques and have a lot of fun with, you know, I guess that would make it more of a Christmas ornament thing. Okay. The size so, that you have, have there reminds me of the comfort birds that our club and many other clubs have been carving. And I wonder whether a nice rounded version without feet or anything could be used as a comfort, uh, uh, jack pine, you mm. know, uh, uh, as oh, long yeah, as yeah. I suppose the scales are, aren't too prickly or anything like that, handling that with a nice face on it might be very interesting for a youngster. Well, that's or, uh, interesting. For an old and, person. Well, you know, Eric, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the development of this, it was designed for children. But we're finding that seniors are starting to visit all these nature posts. And so, uh, yeah, that's a really good idea because uh, we actually have a different audience than we first envisioned years ago when we started this project. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a, 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 another whole group of people that could be our maybe sales too. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Right. And I say, hey. I, 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 wish, uh, I, I wish that uh, Murray was able to talk. He's the one who, who came up with this idea, not yeah. me. Well, you, but, can, you can pass these ideas on to him then. Yeah, well, he, he's on the call. I saw him, but yeah, uh, he just maybe is... trouble with audio or something. So. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was a really good, healthy discussion on uh, the what's on the bench. Uh, that was really interesting. So thanks for everybody participating in that. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Fred now, if you're ready, Fred. And um, I think uh, you'll, you'll have to tell me which slide to go to next, Fred, but I'll get you to kind of talk through your um, carving Snoopy and Woodstock project. You there, Fred? All I hear is crickets. I know. <laughs> How's that? Better? Oh, there we go. All right, there we go. I think you the keyboard. So that, that's a good uh, spot to um, start on, Mark. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Perfectly. Yep. So I, I wanted to do a caricature carving. I was inspired by all you guys uh, doing different stuff. And um, everything I saw wasn't quite what I wanted. I don't know why, but uh, it just didn't appeal to me. Uh, I, I kind of started looking through Pinterest and uh, I always liked Snoopy. So I thought I would do something very unique. So I came up with the idea of maybe I could do a Snoopy on top of his doghouse, as you oh. probably all have seen it. He's always been yeah. a cute guy. And and I have to give credit to, of course, Charles Schultz, who, who put all this stuff together. And um, I started this project with one idea in mind. I really didn't know where I was going to end up, but I took my time in, in designing parts of it. And as I went along, I said, well, maybe I could do this as well. Maybe I could add that as well. It was always um, a challenge to just look ahead and, and see where it would lead me. So the first thing I did is I actually grabbed a bunch of, I wanted to, to put the rough outs together. Um, so I thought about that. 
And what I did was then I, I tried to form a proportion house to dog, basically. Then, of course, from the dog Woodstock's perspective in, in, in relation to size. Um, yeah. I came up with something I put together uh, on paper. I actually started to, to come up with a plan and, and I prepared the rough outs. And for some reason, the doghouse seems seemed to be the best place to start. Because then from the doghouse, I could actually it? set up Snoopy. So Snoop, the, the doghouse I looked at, and I wasn't sure exactly how to accomplish it. But uh, he's, it's not really that bad or that, that big. And I don't know. Can you see this okay? Yep. Can you see this okay? Yep. So it's one block of basswood. And uh, all I did was measure it up and cut it to the center so that um, so that I've got the doghouse effect. And then I sanded everything flat. Then I could get the size of the rough out for Snoopy itself. Now, the way I thought would prepare the doghouse well is to actually form two sides to go across the top. And they, of course, extend slightly beyond the end of the doghouse like that. And, uh, of course, that's where the round dell and such go on top. <laughs> um, once I had that in mind, I actually looked at the opening, the doghouse side. And I, and I thought, if I carve that out, I probably won't get it very effectively. So what I did was... I marked the side here, and then I took this to the bandsaw, and I cut the first quarter inch out. He actually literally cut the first quarter. You can see it in the drawing there. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. So then once I had that off, I had already marked it off, so this part was going to go back on the same spot. Once I had that piece, I actually cut out the dog house opening and once I was satisfied that it was smooth and ready to go I glued the piece back onto the dog house so that it looks as if it's all one piece hmm. and then of course I sanded it so it looks smooth it doesn't look too bad I initially thought the opening should be black and that's what I made it in mind now, I have to admit, I got a lot of encouragement from the people I carve with. I don't know if you guys know or not, but uh, we facilitate carving class at the Senior Center in Kingston. Mark pops in quite often and uh, encourages us to do as we are, uh, whatever we're working on. But uh, I got a lot of encouragement from the people in, in the carving class. So I kept going with this. Um, then I made a rough out. You probably see it. Can you move on? There we go. You can kind of see I sized it so the top and side views are the size I wanted. So they're equal to each other, if you will, size. The only yeah. difference there, the only difference I did there was I opted to put the goggles in front of the eyes as opposed to the top of the head. Everybody see that okay? <laughs> And then, of course, Woodstock is sitting in front of Snoopy. Yeah, thank you. That's great. In the previous picture, you probably noticed Woodstock sitting in front of Snoopy. I didn't choose to do that. I actually put Woodstock behind. So then, just a matter of carving and, and keep uh, tre tweaking at it until I was happy with it. And uh, when I was, then I started burning in all the edges. I literally took the um, the soldering iron, if you will, you know, wood burning set, and I burn in all the edges uh, everywhere where, um, yeah, I don't have a picture of that there. No, that's fine, Fred. So everywhere where you could see where the edges are, I burnt in, including the ears and stuff, once they were carved in. Uh, all the edges were burnt in, including the leather strap mm -hmm. and of course the paws in front and in, in, in the front of the legs and the arms so once I was happy with that then I 
proceeded to look at the color scheme. And I wanted to paint, I believe I painted him uh, brown on the top and then black strapping, as you can see. And uh, the only other thing that was missing from Snoopy at this point is actually the tail. And I, I chose to carve the tail separately and basically glued it on at the end. Um, how you finish it is actually your own idea if you're going to try something like this. Now, I have to tell you a little story here. Everyone was so happy about this particular project that they chose, we, Roger and I and Larry, Roger's in here too, um, <coughs> we, we run workshops for our class once in a while, and they chose to have this as the project of choice for the one time. Um, and believe it or not, they're tur they're turning out well. Uh, the people are turning out uh, really good Snoopy. I'm really happy to hear that. Uh -huh. This guy also, uh, Roger and I and Mark uh -huh. and Larry, we entered, well, I don't think Mark entered, but Mark was certainly there. We entered the, uh, the Quinty uh, carving show. And believe it or not, we all got a prize. Uh, Snoopy here got uh, second prize in uh, in one of the, the caricature carvings. So I'm happy about that. I guess so. Yeah, I am. And uh, considering this is my first, if you will, serious carving of a caricature, I thought it was pretty darn good. Um, any fact, questions? You might, so you might want to talk about this little guy here, yeah, too. Yeah, I will. I was just wondering, was there any questions at this point? Just a comment to make. I love the bullet holes on the on the hub doghouse. Yeah, the bullet yeah. holes. Yeah. That was that was part of the finish, of course. And I didn't want I didn't want too many, so I came up with a random set of bullet holes, and they are basically burnt in after the fact. Um, I think they add to the uh, to the carving quite a lot. So, I was talking about the perspective on. Snoopy, and then I came up with an idea to carve, as you can see, Woodstock. And I like the idea about the handle that you were talking about earlier. I chose to carve, to basically leave the piece on, a longer piece, so you could carve away up until towards the end. You can actually carve this away. And then at the end, you can just chop them off. So it's kind of the same thing, except it was one piece. This guy is pretty small, so it takes a bit of care to get it the way you want it. I I was happy with what I did, and uh, the next one I do probably will be hopefully a little bit better. So the way I attached him to Snoopy, I just made a if we just go back one uh, mark, uh, maybe another one. Where are we? Where's he? Okay, I guess where's it? I, I think this might be there. It is. This is it. Okay. You can see what I did was I simply made a notch in the scarf <clears throat> and stuck wood stock in there with glue. And there's nothing else holding them, and that's all it, that was needed. At that <clears throat> also, notice that the top of the house is a little bit flat. When the two pieces meet, I basically sanded them flat so that. Snoopy would have a flat spot to sit on. To give a little bit of action, if you go to the next one, uh, please, Mark. Um, uh, what I did was where he's mounted, right there, yeah, right, the one above, one before that. Notice that he's leaning slightly forward, and I put a dowel through Snoopy into the doghouse, and he's actually leaning forward slightly to give him a little bit of action looking. And I think that worked out well. I think it accomplished what we wanted to do there. Um, so basically, it's the doghouse, two parts, and then the roof, then uh, Snoopy, the tail, and the doll at this point. Doesn't look too bad, I think. Um, I finished 
the doghouse, I finished all the parts first and I, I dry fitted everything together before I glued it. I made sure that the dowel, sorry, the round dowel was burnt in before I painted it. Part of that is in the book. That I actually put a book together on how to put it together. You can see this is the right size, if you will, of the one I I published. Um, so this is according to the pictures I actually saw. Um, I think it turned out well. I had fun with it. And um, I'm actually working on a different Snoopy one right now. Uh, but uh, this one's certainly one of my favorites. You did a really um, good job on it, Fred. Yeah, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Are there any questions at all? Nice job. Really nice. Thank you. So what we what we did is we actually made kit bags, and we put all the pieces that were required in there for students, and. Uh, we all they all worked at their own pace. Obviously, we didn't get the project done in the in the time allotted, but because we're in the same class, they keep coming back to us for how to finish this or how to proceed with that. And it's it's actually a good process. Um I'm happy to be doing this. I'm actually very happy to be in this club with you guys. Thank you very much for inviting me on board there, Mark. And uh I am really inspired by all your work, all you guys. Thank you very much for uh showing me your stuff. Well, thanks for this, Fred. So I just I want to just go back to something Fred said. So Fred has put together, as detailed you see here, a stepwise process for pulling this together with you know text and photos. He's got about an eight page PDF, and uh, you know included in that is all the all the pieces required, sizes of basswood and block that you need. And uh, he's been very generous in suggesting he'd be glad to send that PDF to anybody who'd like to take on this project and uh, show us your results when you're finished. So, um, you know, you can, uh, I guess it'd be easiest for you to contact me if you're interested in this project and uh, I'll let Fred know and we'll make sure you get that PDF and, uh, and uh, you'll have a lot of fun with it and hopefully you'll send in the pictures so we can take a look at it as well. That'd be great. Yeah. That's super. So thank you, Fred, for, for being so generous with this, with this work of yours, a great project. No problem. My only other concern was um, because it is a copyrighted piece of work, if you will. Obviously, I'm not going to mass produce this. I'm not going to do that. But uh, uh, just be aware that it is it is um, a character that I didn't put together. But uh, if you make changes to your project, you're allowed to do certain things with them. But just remember that it is a copyrighted uh, artwork, if you will, right? I'm sure we all copy stuff now and then just for our own use, but uh, I thought I'd mention that. It's, it's our version of Charles Schultz's work, right? So that's great. Thanks very much, Fred. Tony, you might want to just mute your phone there because uh, when you move the phone, it, it takes over the call. Yeah, just just put your audio on mute and uh, come off of mute when you want to say something. Okay, so there's a couple of things, a few things we have left. We've had some really good conversations here. Um, we've put together a few slides of the shows. Um, Murray, maybe we should leave that for the next meeting to talk about. Murray, are you there? Murray. Has anybody seen Murray? <laughs> I think I think we'll leave uh, the the show stuff for our, our next uh, our, our next call. But I will uh, spend a minute just talking about the Lang event. So as it stands right now, there's six or seven of us who have indicated an interest in uh, attending the the Lang Pioneer Village. That's July 22nd. Um, for those six or seven people, I'll send out an email. Uh, giving you a little bit more of the specifics. I want to say it's July 22nd for sure, but I'm thinking the at the park uh, uh, time slot we have is from 10 in the morning to four in the afternoon. It's something where you can uh, bring your family with you. Uh, we're going to park in a certain area and your family is uh, can attend uh, without an entrance fee because we are part of um, 
we're, we are part of the um, uh, the park offering for that day. Um, bring a lunch uh, for those six or seven people. And I was also going to suggest that um, everybody bring a caricature that you're working on. I'll be there and I'll be glad to help you with it. Uh, Murray will be there as well and can help out. Um, if you're interested um, for those six or seven uh, that have shown an interest, uh, I can bring a project for you, like the boot we've talked about. I can bring you a rough out of the boot. I can also bring you a rough out of the little bell that I work on. So, um, so it'll be a, it'll be a lot of fun for the day. Uh, if you're not amongst the six or seven already and you want to join us, please just send me an email. We'd love to have a large group there, and it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a fun day. Okay, any questions on the Lang event? I do chainsaw stuff. How am I going to fit in? Well, just you're, you're going to have to bring your own heavy equipment, Tony. That's all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you okay. know, uh, right. a, cha a chainsaw version of uh, Snoopy and Woodstock could work for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've done Yosemite Sam. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna very quickly then uh, just go over um, my notion of carving a bowl, and um, stop me as I'm talking if you have any questions. Okay. So you know I've been doing these little um, these little uh, Christmas bells. I put a hook on the top and they hang up on the Christmas tree, similar to what Wayne Smith Wayne was showing us of uh, his ornaments. So this is a little Christmas bell, and you can see it's very very small. Um, it's kind of fun when you put a, a separate bowl onto the top of it, just above the eyebrows. It just adds a little bit more life to the uh, carving. And certainly when you paint it, it adds a lot of nice color and, uh, and fun to the carving. And so I'm going to walk you through those bowls. And um, again, you can see how small this is. Um, I've also made um, these bells that would sit on a desktop that are larger than your hand, or at least as large as your hand. The bow is a lot easier to carve in those. And so if you want to try a bow, uh, just as a separate bow, you don't have to make it this small. Make it to whatever size you're comfortable with holding in your hand. Um, what I do is I just hold the uh, carving, in this instance, a bell up to a blank piece of paper, and I just carve in where I think a bow would be. So the top bow and a ribbon coming down and where the knot would be. And then I fold that piece of paper over, and now I have a symmetrical bow if I just take a pair of scissors and I cut around that. And that's what you see me doing here. So just cutting around that, I unfold it, and now I have an exact size bow that I want to make. Now notice that the inside of these ribbons of the bow are touching the head. They're smaller. The, the, the span between those ribbons is smaller than the span or diameter of the, of the uh, top of the bell here. And that's because I want that ribbon to eventually lay down on the bell rather than stand out from it. Okay? So that's pretty simple. Take it to the bandsaw, uh, put it on a piece of wood, um, I'm going to tell you right now that I made a mistake in doing this. I, I ran the green in this direction. I typically run the green in this direction. And I run the green in this direction because I want the greatest strength going across the top of the bow in this knot. Uh, this time I thought I'd run the green in this direction to get the, the, the strength in this thin ribbon. Uh, it was a mistake because as I necked down this bow, I kept breaking around this knot. So um, everything I'm going to tell you uh, on how to go, how I went about doing this, that you can copy if you like, uh, still applies, but I would orient the green in this direction. Uh, one of the things I wanted to tell you, though, is that because I was using about an inch and a half wood here, I made a multiple number of um, uh, ribbons so that I could use on a variety of different uh, ornaments. And so you can see the initial cut was here, and then I just cut it along in this direction to make up three separate pieces. Now, the thing I wanted to mention to you, if you're using a bandsaw, you can see I didn't try to first cut this because that would be impossible to put as a flat base on the bandsaw to cut. So I drew this line up above it here, the one you see here. And when I cut that, that allowed me a nice base now to cut these long lines when I broke up the three pieces. If I had cut around that knot initially, that that thing would have rocked all over the place and I would have could have hurt myself or certainly broke the, the, the bandsaw blade. So having a flat surface really, really critical. 
after I cut the three pieces separately, then I came back and I cut along actually where the bow was going to uh, be situated, like this here second line. Okay, hope everybody understands that. Uh, then it's a matter of starting to to do your carving, and so I just put an X on this on this here section just to keep reminding me that this was going to be the weakest spot and be careful when I'm when I'm carving. And so what I did was I just said, okay, this line is going to represent the bottom of the bow. The the bandsaw cut is representing the top of the bow. So I know knew I was going to have to make a score through here. I had to make the knot, so I I knew I was going to have to make scores through here. And I knew the top of the bowl was going to be uh, kind of elliptical, right? So it'd have a nice, nice curve to it. So now I had sort of an eye impression of what this uh, was initially going to look uh, look like, rather as a as a rough oak. Um, we've been talking many, many times about getting roundness, and I wanted this roundness in the top of the bowl. So I went ahead and I drew a center line at the side of the bowl. And I drew another center line at the widest part of the bow. So you can see it's kind of elliptical. So the it's not a true center line down the middle here, but it's a center line a little closer to the end. And then I just started carving that away to make it nice and round. So you carve from one center line to the other center line. So you can imagine here if I scored through here with my knife, and then I started removing this, I got a nice rounded version of the top of that ribbon okay and you can see it's also necked in around where um where the um the knot would be on the bowl okay and again stop me if i'm not explaining something well and so once i did that on both sides i got a nice rounded version here i got a nice rounded version there the knot is starting to poke out a little bit you can see the ribbon underneath to some extent the uh, the the bowl then I, I knew that I had to cut away the inside of these ribbons for it to fit back on the head. And so I could have gone at this point and done that little business that we've talked about several times about putting lead on the carving and then having the lead impress itself on the, on the bow and carve that away. But I knew a lot had to come off. So I was just able to eyeball it and say, look, I've got to remove a lot of material here and similarly on this side, a lot of material, so it parks back on the forehead. So that's what I did. And in this case, I just marked again for myself, this is the direction of the grain. So I made sure I cut in this direction, because if I cut in the opposite direction, I'd be cutting against the grain, and I'd break it. I'd break that little, uh, little ribbon. So I cut in the lay of the grain going down this way. So you can see how that's starting to shape up. And this here is a picture of the inside that I've cleared away. So this is the inside of the ribbons that are going to park up against the uh, the bell, the forehead of the caricature. Okay, everybody following that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, and then um, at that point, I needed to park that that whole ribbon uh, composite further back on the head, so I needed to hollow out this section here of the ribbon because of the of the um, of the um, the, where, where the ribbon is tied. And so where the ribbon is tied, it would have been flat at the back initially. I knew that that had to be now concave in order to get everything to move back. So I hollowed that out with a gouge and a little bit of knife work until it parked nicely back in there. And so I got it about where I wanted. Um, the inside of this is now following the contour of this, uh, this bell. Uh, the inside of this knot is now following the contour roughly of this handle. And so then I needed to start taking a look at what's the ribbon going to look like. I didn't want a ribbon just square like this, so I kind of draped it back a little bit. So I just, with a pencil, I just marked where I'd like it's kind of swept back. And you can see here, I just started carving that. So it's swept back, still very chunky, but you can see that it's carved, swept back. Remember the back of this is still kind of on an angle and it's fitting against the bell. Now I wanted to get a little bit tighter with the fit. So mm -hmm. I use this notion of lead and, and uh, the lead type that I use, and I'm not sure if it's it's 100% lead, but it's certainly lead-like, it's called Creta Color. And it's very, very soft, uh, probably lead with a little pastel in it. 
So you can see, I just, uh, I just rubbed that pastel all over the parts where the bow was meeting. As I press the bow up against that now, it made an impression of that lead wherever it was high. And so now I took a small gouge and I just took out those portions, nothing more, just, just removed all that black. I did that probably three or four or five, six times until everything moved completely ba back into uh, meeting here very tightly and meeting at the sides where the ribbons fall very, very tightly. Um, this is a ver very difficult picture to see, but what you're looking at is this here is the knot of the ribbon and it's concave. These are the insides of the, uh, of the, the ribbon that are draped down the head. And, and you can see that um, although I swept these things back, still the outside is very chunky. And so I wanted it to be very thin. I wanted it to make look like a ribbon. So I, I just drew a line that followed the contour of the inside that I had put a lot of effort into making sure fit really tightly. This line follows right up to the, the, um, the, the, the tie section here, uh, the knot. It follows this line because, of course, that line fit very well with the bell. So there's this pencil line. And if you could see it, there's a pencil line in the back on both sides that show the same width. And then I just whittled that outside piece away. You can see in this, looking up through at the ribbon, you can see I let it go very, very thin at, um, at the very end of the ribbon. But it's a lot beefier as it approaches the ribbon uh, or the bow and the and the knot and and that's just for strength right you want it you want it back here to be pretty strong you don't care if it's just a little bit too thin here at the end and it, it looks nice having it thin at the end and then at this point this is what the front looked like now these things are very thin um, and so you're when you when you are carving you're holding on to these sections here you're not holding on to these little thin sections because they'll break to, uh, to make a knot, I just showed uh, two lines. I made a cut in this direction and a cut a half to that line and just hollowed that out a little bit. So I made a stop cut and then, and then with that stop cut, made sure I undercut that piece, made another stop cut here and under, underscored that piece. And it gave you the impression of a, a layered knot, okay? And then it was time to uh, to make the top of the uh, bow look like it was ribbon. So again, I just you know I picked a, a, a thickness that I thought would look nice. I drew in a pencil line. I I scored pretty deeply with a sharp knife to make a V cut here, and then scored around it to uh, to make this rounded section. And then I used a very small gouge to gouge out that. And I I started here with the gouge and and drove it this way and scooped it out. And I did that on both sides. And it just, you know, you can go as deep as you want. You really don't have to go very deep. You're just trying to give a little bit of an impression of depth there. And that, in fact, the ribbon is made up of, uh, you know, a very light thickness of material. And then from there, it looked like this. And so uh, the top is hollowed out, as I just described. Uh, you can see here where I undercut those... Um, that uh, that knot to make it look like it's a fold underneath a fold. Um, I thought that these looked a little square at this point in time. So I just took a pencil and I said, geez, I'd like to make that a little more rounder. So I, so I just drew a little bit more of a rounded version of that and cut that away. And then I drew, uh, I just drew a little concave here the way I'd like it to look. So rather than just having a flat ribbon come down, I wanted everything to be concave in a little bit on the sides and on the front. And so you can see that here. And I just used, uh, I just used my knife really, but you could use a gouge as well. And just that's a little more concave. You can see a little bit of concave version in here. And then it disappears to be fairly flat in here. I drew in a couple or three lines on each side to represent wrinkles. And I just made a couple of uh, cuts into the wrinkles to, or into the wood to, to make it look like it's, it's bunched at the knot. And that's what it looked like. And so after, uh, uh, after a little bit of wood burning, um, it kind of helped, uh, you know, the element stand out a little bit more. Uh, what I did with the wood burning is I, as I wood burned, you can see it's fairly deep wood burn here, isn't it? 
you can see it notched in there. So I, I a fairly deep wood burn along the edges of the ribbon, along the edges of the ribbon that falls down here. And what I, the reason I do that is when I paint this, I like to have the ribbon, the ribbon red in these sections, and I like a little gold on the outside section here. And so by having that valley, a fairly deep valley that I've cut in with the wood burning tool, I can go ahead even with my shaky hand and, uh, and paint this in red. It doesn't bleed into the next piece. It stops right at that valley. Then I come back with gold. I put it in this little section here. It goes no farther than that valley again. And so I have a nice crisp line. Okay. And that's how I do those. Okay. Any uh, comments, questions? Any yeah, I got one. Uh, yeah. When you uh, you used that lead, uh, I don't know what it was, a lead. It wasn't a pencil, but it was yeah, the lead. Called, to, to yeah, market. it was called Critical. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. When you when you got what you when you've got it on there and you've got it carved down to what you want, is that difficult to get off your wood, like the the remains of it? Yeah, no, it isn't. Uh, so what I do is uh, you could just use like a, a scrub brush, like a little nail brush with some soap and it'll take it right off. Uh, what I normally do is I go over it with a knife. And so I'll just take like, you know, a couple of thou off, really. You're not taking much wood at all. You're just more or less scraping that stuff off. And then uh, when when the majority of it has been cut away, then I'll take a, a nail brush to it with the soap underneath the running water and it and it comes right off. Okay. Yeah. So I could just pick vision me with <laughs> I'd have that thing black from one end to the other. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that can I guess that can happen. You know, if you if you if have you tried that Wayne before? Uh, well, I have a uh, yeah, it's a I use a graphite uh, yep. pencil. Actually, it was something I I was following Carolyn around in the quilt supply shop one day, and I and I found it. But yeah, yeah you got to be careful with that because, like I say, it's it uh, it can mess things up in a hurry. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to use anything that'll be absorbed into the wood for sure. And this doesn't. It, it just lays on top of the wood, and okay. it's easy to cut away and it's easy to scrub away for sure. And it doesn't interfere with any painting that you do afterwards. But in terms of uh, when you get to the point where you really want a tight fit, and I and I do want a tight fit on these these bows because they're so tiny. <laughs> And in one direction of the bow, it's always going to be really weak. And so when you glue this down, you want it glued really down here. You want it glued down here and you want to glue it down here. Um, right. This tends to be fairly strong because it's bulky. And it's also strong because the tail end of it is glued down to the bell. And this process of uh, scribing and mating it together and picking up the, the high spots is a nice way of just getting a, it's not an airtight fit, but it's, it's a tight enough fit that you can even put like a, um, a CA glue, a super glue in there and, and it'll bond. You don't need a big blob of glue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you ever just stain and varnish something like that? Because with your wood burning accents, that could look really good. Yeah, Tony, um, it, it, I guess it depends on the kind of wood. Th these tend to be uh, basswood. And basswood, in my opinion, doesn't look very nice stained. Uh, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't. Have a very, doesn't have a very nice green. But if you made it out of uh, something soft like uh, butternut or something like that, yeah. it would it would look really good with a stain, I think. Oh, OK. Yeah, basswood just, uh, maybe somebody else would chirp in. Uh, my experience with basswood is that to just put a stain on the bare wood, it's just, you, you're just not pleased with the end result. Oh, because I got a big hunk of basswood at home. I don't know what to do with it yet. So <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, if you want to stain it, you're, you there's a guy. Doesn't look uh, so good. There, there's an out, outstanding carver named Fred Zavadil. He's, he lives either in Sarnia or Windsor. He has a uh, website. His last name is Zavadil, Z-A-V-A-D-I-L. Check it out because he has a video on how he goes about finishing uh, basswood. And he seals oh. it basically with urethane and then applies a stain on top of that. So the stain actually just sits on top of the urethane. It on top of the urethane. urethane? Yeah, and it okay. looks really nice. Check that video out. It looks really good. Really good. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, guys and gals?
Okay. You know, I think that's uh I think that's a wrap for tonight. So um that was good. John, maybe we'll uh, pick up the conversation about the uh, an upcoming competition in July. Yeah, no problem. And, yeah. And um you know, we uh I guess we'll have had the Lang event before our next Zoom call. So again, anybody interested in going to the Pioneer Village and joining Murray and I and uh, half a dozen others that have shown an interest, uh, just let me know, okay? And you'll have a lot of fun, I guarantee. Mark, just before you leave, could you spell that name again, please? It's Zavadil, Z-A-V-A-D-I-L. It's Fred Zavadil. And uh, when you see his carvings, you'll you'll it'll blow your mind. He he's at a he's at such a master's level. He's 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 uh, he sends his carvings worldwide, and they're in some of the biggest churches and cathedrals in the world. And, wow. and uh, he he does. I know he does have this one video that shows how he finishes it with uh, with urethane, and then. He makes his own stain and and highlights parts of it, and it's just it's absolutely incredible work. So, yeah. great. He teaches Thanks. out of Windsor, Ontario. Windsor, okay, good. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, big, folks. Big thanks. thanks. For big thank you to everybody who showed stuff tonight, and I appreciate that to see your work. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Thank you to you, uh, Fred. That was a uh, that, that's going to be a fun little project for people. Okay, folks, have a great month ahead and looking forward to seeing you next month.